Part 3 is about Statistical Process Control, or SPC, which was developed by Walter Schuert. It's very important to understand statistical process control and the concepts of Walter Schuert if we're going to understand what Six Sigma Quality is all about. Walter Schuert developed SPC in the 20s and introduced it at that time. He based SPC on statistical theory. One of the major concepts is that there are different types of variation and they contribute to the overall process variation. It's real important that we understand which type of variation we're dealing with because each type requires a different type of management action. Dr. W. Dem Edwards Deming studied under Schuert and was very active in promoting SPC later on. Schuert taught that there are three types of variation, and Six Sigma is all about reducing variation, so this is very important. The first type is common cause variation. This is the built-in random variation in the system, which is difficult to reduce without changing the system or the process itself. Typically, workers aren't responsible for the overall system or the processes that they're using, so this is definitely the management aspect of reducing variation. The second type is assignable or special cause variation. This is variation that's easy to identify. Usually it's caused by things that are going on in the work area with the work group. It could be a worker error. It could be uh, the wrong material stock to the job. There's all kinds of different things, but they're usually identifiable and uh, under the control of the work group. The third type of variation is something often overlooked. It's called tampering. And this is over-adjusting a process which results in increased variation. Sometimes what is random variation in a process is treated by management as an assignable cause variation. And then they continue to make adjustments thinking that they're correcting the variation. In fact, what they're doing is adding variation to the system. At this point, it would be a good idea to explain a little bit about the normal distribution. Now, sometimes we've heard this discussed by the name the bell curve or the bell-shaped curve. In scientific circles, it's called the Gaussian distribution, but we'll call it the normal distribution. The normal distribution has the center at the average or mean and here it's shown with X being the average or the mean and the spread is measured by what's called the standard deviation and it's shown here as plus one sigma plus two sigma plus three sigma to the right and then minus one two and three sigma to the left with the normal distribution, we find that about two-thirds, or 68.26% of the population can, found, can be found within plus or minus one standard deviation uh, from the mean. And likewise, plus and minus two standard deviation contains about 95% of the population, and plus or minus three standard deviations contains 99.73% of the population, which is so close to 100% that we often think of practically the whole population being within one uh, plus and minus three standard deviations of the mean. What's important about the normal distribution is that it characterizes much of what we find in nature and much of what we find in random variation in human or man-made processes. So the normal distribution is helpful to us in characterizing what the uh, spread is for things that we find. Let's demonstrate how we use the normal distribution in working with the quality of parts that are being produced. Here we have a manufacturing process producing a part and we're going to measure a particular feature. If we had all the measurements for all the parts produced, we would have the whole population 
or the parent population. From that, we could figure out what the population average or mean is, and that's usually denoted by the Greek letter mu, and we could also figure out the population standard deviation, which is typically known by the Greek letter sigma. Typically, though, we don't know what the population looks like. So we sometimes will take a sample and use that to give us an idea of what the population is like. Here we're taking a sample of 70 parts, measuring them, and we're plotting the parts on a histogram. The height of each bar represents a higher frequency of parts at that particular dimension. And so you can see that it starts to take shape as we get a higher frequency in our sample. You can also see that if we plot the lower specification limit and the upper specification limit, we can begin to get an idea of how many parts may be below or above the specification limits producing scrap and rework. We often then will take our sample uh, statistics and uh, we'll add up all of the means and uh, all of the parts and divide by the sample size to get the mean x bar that's our sample mean and we'll take uh, the same measurements and calculate the sample standard deviation s and these we use to infer what the population might look like we can also get a feel for how capable the process is of producing within specifications by calculating a process capability index called CP. That's shown at the bottom, which will be discussed in more detail later. But the normal distribution characterizes the population of dimensions uh, much of the time when what we're talking about is just the random common cause variation of the process. This brings us to the first major concept of statistical process control, which is process capability. Simply stated, process capability is the ability of a process to produce within specification limits when there are no assignable causes or tampering going on. The only process variation we have is the uh, common cause or built-in or natural variation. And if that's the only kind of variation we have, and if we're still able to produce within specifications, then the process is called capable. And if it can't produce within specifications, then it's not capable. Capability is often uh, characterized by two different indices. One is CP, that's the ability to stay within specs if the process were centered properly. And then CPK is the ability to stay in specs based on where the process is currently centered. The second major concept is process control. This refers to how stable and consistent a process is. If a process is stable, that is only experiencing random built-in variation or common cause variation, we say it's in control. If it's experiencing assignable cause variation, then we say the process is not in control. Note that a process can be stable and in control but because of excessive variation, it may not be capable. So capability and control are two different things, and we're concerned about both. Note that special cause variation typically only represents a small proportion of the problems that we have with a process. Let's see if we can graphically explain process control and capability. On the top, we see on the left a process that starts out and as time progresses the distributions are shown going back and to the right. We see that a pro the process starts out being unstable. The mean and the variation changes over time. So the process in those first three distributions is not in control. In the back though we see a process where the variation is the same and the center is the same over time. Here we don't have any special causes present. We only have random built-in variation. That part of the process is called in control. 
The bottom part of the slide shows process capability. The red lines represent the specification limits and you can see the first three distributions even though the process is stable there are some parts being produced below and above the specification limits so while that process is in control it's not capable and then at the back part of that distribution you can see that now the variation has been reduced the parts are being produced within specifications plus they're stable so now we have a process that is in control and capable. So you can see that being in control and capable is the desire of all of our efforts in quality and we typically will work first on making a process in control and then work on making it capable. This next slide is a little busy but we're going to use it to illustrate the concept of a statistical process control or SPC chart. This is the tool that Sheward invented to be used on the production floor to help determine what type of variation is going on in a real-time situation. It's amazing to me that these charts were created back in the 20s, back when we didn't have slide uh, calculators. All we had were slide rules and charts, and pencils and paper. But that's the beauty of these charts is they are fairly easy to make with simple four uh, function arithmetic. But anyway, let's take a look. The top graph is called an X bar chart. And what we have on there are upper and lower control limits. Those are shown with the dashed lines. And on the right, you can see the upper control limit and lower control limit are denoted. And what are plotted on there are sample averages. Samples are taken every so often, maybe a sample of size 4 or 5. The mean is calculated for the sample and it's plotted on the chart. As long as the uh, points plot within the control limits, uh, the process is stable. And we are satisfied that we don't have any assignable causes present. The only pre variation present is the uh, built-in or common cause variation. The bottom part of the chart is, is what we call the R chart, the range chart. And what we do there is we take the sample range for each sample, the maximum minus the minimum from each sample we took and we calculate that and we plot it and here what we're looking for is any inconsistencies in the variation and so the X bar and R chart are used together to monitor the for the presence of assignable causes this is the workhorse of SPC and has been used uh, over the decades to help monitor processes and determine when assignable causes are present. Let's use an example to demonstrate how SPC works and what its power is. Here we have a part, we're measuring the diameter, we're taking samples of size 4, we're averaging the samples and plotting those averages on a control chart. The control chart is the upper and lower control limits and those are shown in the middle of the chart. We're also showing on this chart for illustration purposes the specification limits. So you can see here that these sample averages are falling within the specification limits and the process is probably capable in the terms of SPC. But over time in this particular process the average starts to drop and falls below the lower control limit due to an assignable cause. When we see these points below the lower control limit, it alerts the people in the work area that we have an assignable cause and we need to find it and eliminate it. In this case, the tool needed to be reset. After the tool was reset, the parts are now being produced back within the control limits and the process is stable again. But let's point out a few things here. First of all, none of these parts were probably outside of specification limits. We found the problem 
we found the assignable cause and we fixed it before we had any parts that were bad. So this is the preventative aspect of statistical process control. We're finding problems and fixing them before they produce defective parts. This is a very powerful thing. You'll notice that this differs in concept from inspection, where we're checking for whether or not a part is good or bad. Here we're checking for whether or not there are assignable causes present so we can fix them. At this point, let me jump ahead a little bit and just add that you'll notice that the use of data here is strictly for improving the process. If you happen to be in an environment where data that's collected is used for placing blame and not for working on the process, then if you want to implement statistical process control, you might have to go through a culture change where people begin to trust that data will be used properly. Not too long after Schuert developed SPC, Dodge and Romick developed acceptance sampling. Acceptance sampling is a way of avoiding 100% inspection for incoming parts. It saves a lot of money if you could just inspect a sample and not the whole batch. They came up with charts where you could determine a sampling plan, which was a sample size to pick out of a lot and what the critical numbers would be for accepting or rejecting the whole lot. The idea is that if your sample was good enough, you would go ahead and accept the whole batch. If the sample was bad, you would reject the whole batch and send it back to the supplier and let them worry about how to fix it. The whole concept saves a lot of money, but you have to understand that it is subject to sampling error and also to inspection error. But the sampling error could be managed by varying the sample plan uh, to meet your needs. So let's wrap up this part by pointing out that modern quality management is rooted in understanding statistical process control. The underlying premise is that most problems are with the system. 90% or more of the problems are caused by the system and the way it's designed, not human error. So we want to fix the system, get everyone involved in the system, and find the permanent solutions. So quality is the responsibility of everyone. It also leads to the use of teams to solve problems because properly formed teams have a better understanding of the overall system and how it relates, how it's connected, and all the internal and external customers involved. So everyone needs to understand who their customer is and what the customer needs and how good of a job they can do at providing what the customer needs.